Good morning again. You know, yesterday, anybody remember what yesterday was? April Fool's Day. I thought about getting up here and starting with something on April Fool's Day, but then I thought, no, that would be late and that wouldn't be good. So anyway, you'll just have to wait and experience April Fool's Day another time. If you have your Bibles open to uh, Matthew chapter 27, Matthew chapter 27. While you're finding it, uh, I hope you can continue to listen as well. It was an atheist who was complaining to his uh, Christian friends. He said, uh, listen, I said, you Christians have your special holidays. You get together and you celebrate Christmas and you get to celebrate Easter. He said, even the Jewish people, they have their special holidays that are set aside for them to celebrate. Uh, you get to, uh, they celebrate the Passover, which we are entering into that time of year. They celebrate Yom Kippur. They celebrate other holidays. He said, even the Muslims have their special days they get to celebrate. But he said, you know, we atheists, we don't even have one special holiday holiday that we get to celebrate from. And his friend says, well, you might try April 1st. <laughs> he said, here's why. He said in Matthew 14 and verse 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. And so they might try celebrating on uh, April Fool's Day uh, to do that. You know, to celebrate, uh, we get to celebrate uh, a lot of holidays. Two of our special ones that I think as Christians we love to celebrate are Christmas and Easter. Uh, you know, those are special days where we come together and uh, people come to church. Then you may not see them any other time of the year, but you'll see them at Christmas and Easter because that is uh, special holidays. And uh, it starts out uh, on a high note. You know, today is Palm Sunday where they welcome Jesus as he came into the city and they took palm uh, branches and put in front of him and they proclaimed uh, him and, uh, as the Messiah. They uh, looked at him as being a, a prophet and someone very special. And it goes from the high of, of this day when he enters into the city and then uh, on Friday uh, he goes to the cross and all of a sudden this high excitement goes to discouragement and defeat and, and thinking that uh, they, they'd lost it all. And then, guess what? It turns around again, and on Easter Sunday, they are all excited and celebrating once again. Right now, this week, we go through all those emotions, and, and we think about them. And I think, you know, Easter is a time when we should be excited and celebrating about that day. Because in reality, that's what we celebrate, and that's what we worship every Sunday as we come together. We celebrate the, the resurrection of Jesus. But I think how special that first Sunday was, where they got excited about Jesus coming. <laughs> Throughout the Bible, it talks about their excitement. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 8, it says, uh, Two women quickly departed from the tomb. They were filled with great joy. And what did they do? They ran to report to the disciples. They ran to report this to them. In Mark chapter 16 and verses 1 through 8, the women who had prepared and, uh, and brought spices, uh, they found that Jesus wasn't there. And so they ran and, and told the disciples again uh, the excitement and joy that was there. When Peter and John heard this great news, what did they do? They turned around and they ran back. You see, there was an excitement about Easter. And I hope that you are excited about what God has in store uh, for you and for this church. There's an excitement that's there. Uh, I hope you're so excited that you take and you invite somebody to come with you next Sunday. Because that might be the one Sunday that they choose to respond and come and, and hear the great news of, of great joy that we have and that we celebrate and that we share every week. Uh, you know, we should in, uh, take advantage of their, their willingness to celebrate this special holiday of Easter and invite them to, to come uh, to join us in celebrating that. What is the source of that excitement? I think it is the difference that the cross and the resurrection make in a person's life. 
You see, the cross does make a difference in the things that we do and the things that we say in, 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 in our lives. The, the cross truly makes a difference. And so we just celebrated that through partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, on Friday, Jesus would uh, uh, go to the cross and, and to die for us. And so here we come, and I, I just want to focus uh, our attention just a little bit today as we prepare for these exciting events about the difference the cross makes in a person's life. And we want to look at one person's life who uh, was totally changed because of the cross and what was there. And this is found in Matthew chapter 27. So if you have your Bibles, as John says, open up or your Bible, open up your phone, open up your app, whatever, but turn and, and follow along as we look at uh, the difference the cross made in the life of a man named Barabbas. And so we often uh, don't look at this person in relation to Easter, but yet I think it's one that we should uh, and that we can relate to very well uh, about him. So follow along as we read Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priest and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him. And he said, Why? What, is evil, what evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. You know, God's word is so special. I hope that you allow him to speak to your heart as we read through that. Let's just bow for a second right now, just a few minutes and a few seconds. And, and you ask in your own heart that God would take and apply this message to you, that you would ask God to speak to your heart in a special way this morning about the difference the cross can make in your life and the lives of those around you. Let's pray. Dear God, in the silence of this few moments, Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to our hearts. Lord, we look up to you with hungry hearts and asking that you would fill them today, that you would take your word and that you would apply it especially to, to my heart, that you would apply it to our hearts this morning. Uh, God, I pray that uh, we would hear from you as you uh, share with us the, the excitement and joy that comes from knowing Jesus and knowing what he's done for us. God, as we look at this passage, I pray that you would just teach us. We ask in your name. Amen. You know, Barabbas is one of the principal characters in the story of the crucifixion. And yet, he's one that we don't often hear preached about. In fact, I think I could probably count on one hand the number of times I've heard a message about Barabbas. Uh, usually we, we just kind of skip over him. And yet I think he's one person that we can especially relate to or we should be able to relate to when it comes to this story. So let's stop and examine Barabbas a little bit closer and, and try to see some of the things that, of how that you and I can relate to him. You know, the first thing I think we should notice is notice that his state 
And just what was his state? Well, you look here in, in verse 16 and you notice that he was a prisoner and that he was arrested and that he was awaiting death. And so that was his state. Uh, in fact, uh, the Romans uh, here uh, considered him to be a, a very notorious uh, prisoner. Uh, now, what does the word notorious mean? In the Greek, it, it means one that is distinguished in any way. And so what distinguished Barabbas was the fact that he was a, a very wicked, a very bad person. And he was in jail. Uh, now, we don't know all the things that Barabbas did uh, because the Bible doesn't tell us all of it. But it does tell us some of the things that he was guilty of and why he was in prison and why he was uh, awaiting death. In uh, John chapter 18 and verse 40, it says, uh, Therefore they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. And then it says, Now Barabbas was a robber. Uh, we know that one of the things he was guilty of is that he robbed people and, and he was thrown in jail uh, because of that. Then in Mark 15 and verse 7, it says, And the man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionist who had committed murder in the insurrection. And so we see Barabbas was a notorious person because he was guilty of robbing people. He was guilty of insurrection and he was guilty of murder. And so because of that, the Jews took him and, and put him in, in jail and he was awaiting the execution. Now, just stop and think for a moment what that would be like for Barabbas. And sitting in jail and just waiting, knowing that in a matter of days your execution could come. You know, I, I put myself in that and I go... Man, that would be hard, not knowing when it was going to happen and, and what, uh, how it was going. But he was there waiting, just knowing in a matter of days that he would die. You know, when I think about that, I think, you know, we should be able to relate to that. Because the Bible tells us that we are all in that same state. We are guilty before God because of our sin. And we know what the result, the consequences of that is. It says that for the wages of sin is death. The wages, the payment, the consequences for sin is that death. Now, he was awaiting physical death. Well, we are dead spiritually and we are, will die physically because of our sin. You know, you will one day appear before God, a righteous, holy judge, and you will have to answer to him for all the things that you've done while you've been here on earth. Some of them will appear before him and they will have to answer to him because of, uh, uh, and explain to him why they had that affair outside of marriage. Others will appear before him and they will have to explain why they went to the bars and drank up the, their family's food money. Why they went to the casino and, and gambled it all away instead of feeding their kids and feeding their family. Others, they'll have to explain why they didn't forgive their brother or their sister or their father or their mother. Why they held on to that and, and just kept it so close that they wouldn't ask for forgiveness and wouldn't get right with other people. You know, you can put in whatever sin is there that you will have to answer for. Because you know in your heart that you sinned against God and you know you're going to have to answer for that one day. Most of all, you're going to have to explain why you rejected Jesus as your Savior and why you didn't ask Him to forgive you. We're going to stand there before God and God is going to look and He's going to uh, separate those who know Him from those who do not. In Matthew chapter 25 verse 41, it says, Then He will also say to those on His left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. He's going to say, depart from me, 
go to that place of eternal fire. And what do we call that place? We call that place hell. He's going to say, depart from me and go there. I have to laugh sometimes because people say, well, you know, a loving God would never send someone there. But God is also a holy God, and, and we're going to have to answer for him. And he tells us the wages, the punishment for that is to go to this place. Many people will deny that it's real. But understand this, hell is a real place. And while Jesus was here, he almost talked about that as much as he did heaven. He wants us to know how terrible it is. And I think if we could just get a glimpse, if we could just spend three seconds there and see how terrible it was, how that would change the way that we live our lives today. Because if we could just realize how terrible it was, we would not want even our worst enemies to go there and to experience it. But you see, if we do not trust Jesus as our Savior, and we do not find that forgiveness, that is where we are going, and that is where everyone else is headed that way. It is a real place that lasts for eternity, and those that are guilty of sin will go there. That's where Barabbas was headed. But guess what? The second thing we want to notice is his substitute. You can imagine what was going through Barabbas' minds as they led him out of that cell today to take him to Pilate. I'm sure he thought, today's the day that I'm going to be executed. Today's the day that this is all going to end. But can you imagine when he got there, what he felt when he heard Pilate say to the crowd that was there, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? I'm sure in his mind he thought, what is going on here? Why is he saying, who do you want me to release? You see, Pilate was in a couple of jams here. Because first of all, he was in a, a hard place with the, the Jewish people because they didn't really like him. They didn't like him because he had deliberately violated their laws and he had provoked them. And uh, he ignored their concerns and their feelings. And yet Pilate was in a hard place because he had ambition. And he knew that if the Jewish people complained to Caesar, that Caesar would have to come to investigate. And uh, whether he was proven right or proven wrong, that, uh, that wouldn't be good for his political ambitions. And since he had those, he didn't want to do that. So he had to give credence to the, what they were asking. And so they wanted, and they had brought Jesus to him. And you see, he had to listen to them and respond to them. Now, the second jam was this. He looked at Jesus, and he realized that the Jewish leaders had brought him, uh, Jesus to him, out of envy, as it says here. They brought him out of jealousy. And when Jesus, I mean, when Pilate examined Jesus, you know what he found? He found that Jesus was innocent. He found that he had done nothing wrong. Four times he declares Jesus to be innocent and, and to not have done anything wrong. He did this in Luke 23 and verse 14 and again in verse 20 and in verse 22 and in John 19 and verse 4. He looked at Jesus and said, he's done nothing wrong. Even Pilate's wife sent a message to him and said, don't have anything to do with this righteous man. He's righteous. He hasn't done anything wrong. And so because Pilate realized that he hadn't done anything wrong, he was in a hard place as to what to do with him. You know, the Bible takes it a step further. Because it says that not only did he do anything wrong, it says that he was without sin. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, it says, And he took him who knew no sin and made him sin for us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It says that he knew no sin. 
You know, that's something you and I can't relate to. Because from the time that we are young, from the time that we are born, we have that sinful nature within us. That hunger and that desire to go out here and, and have our own way and to do it our way and not God's way. We have our, that within us to rebel against our parents' authority. We have it in it to rebel uh, against society. We have it in us to, to seek that which is wrong. We can't relate to the fact that Jesus did not have any sin. And yet that is so important. He knew no sin. Pilate thought, I've got a way out of this. This will work. Because it says in verse 15 that now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. And I'm sure Pilate thought, I know what to do. I'll give them a choice. So he went to his prison, and guess what? He got the worst sinner, the worst prisoner that he could find. That was Barabbas. And he brought him out, and it says, they choose this worst prisoner that I have, or will they choose Jesus? You see, he knew that just a few days before this, that Jesus had come marching into town, and the whole city had welcomed him, putting out palm branches, cheering for him, praising God, recognizing that he was the special prophet that God had sent, calling him the Messiah. Would they choose this one who was so wicked and notorious, the worst sinner he could find? Or would they choose Jesus? Pilate's mind, he goes, they'll choose Jesus. Because he knew it was the Jewish leaders who had brought him out of jealousy and envy. But to his surprise, you know what they said? Said, give us Barabbas. Set him free. The crowd cried out for Barabbas. And then Pilate said, well, what do I do with Jesus? He said, crucify him. Crucify him. Pilate, no matter their complaints, no matter what, should have released him because he was innocent. But instead, he gave in to their demands and sent Jesus to be crucified. You see, that day, Jesus became the substitute for Barabbas. Instead of Barabbas going to the cross, Jesus went and took his place. Jesus would have been asked that question, should you release, should you release Barabbas? You know what he would have done? He would have went to the cross. Because he knew how important it was for him to die for the sins of the world. That is why he came. That's why we have Christmas. Because he came to be born so that he could live and go to the cross to become the substitute. He chose to do that and to fulfill prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and 5 it says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. See, he took our place there on the cross. Think what that means personally for you. He took your punishment for you. He took your sins upon himself. And he suffered the punishment for those sins for you. Whipped, beaten, crucified as a substitute because he was innocent. Dr. James Simpson was a famous physician in, in Scotland. And he used to tell of uh, a couple of things that he had witnessed and seen. When he was a boy, he said, I saw a sight I shall never forget. 
a man tied to a cart and dragged through the streets of my hometown. His back was torn and bleeding from the whip. It was a shameful punishment. Why was he whipped and why was he drugged through the town? Because he had committed one sin. He had committed one thing, one offense. And no one had taken part of it, taken his lashes for him. Later on, Dr. Simpson said that he, uh, while he was at school studying, he witnessed one other event. He witnessed the, the, a man being executed for robbery. He was led to the gallows. They said they tied his hands. He was led to the gallows and he was hung there until he died. Why? Because he committed one offense and he suffered the consequences for it. The sad thing, that was the last time either one of those two punishments were ever used in England. And he happened to see both of them. And I think, you know, it's sad for those that had to suffer that way. And yet, we are in a more precarious position than they were. They suffered because they had committed one offense. And you and I, we have committed far more offenses than that. We are guilty of so much more because of our sins that are there. Truth be told, you and I are guilty and we deserve to go to hell because of our sin. Amen. Because only one sin will send us there and we have done so much more than one. And yet, we don't have to go there. You don't have to go there because we have a substitute who died for us. And that substitute is Jesus. He died in our place so that we might be made the righteousness of God. John chapter 3 and verse 36 says this, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Here's a great promise. Promise that says that if we believe on him, if we trust him, we have eternal life. A simple exchange. We trust him. He takes care of our sin and offers us forgiveness. What a great promise. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus to be your substitute, if you never ask him to forgive your sin and give you that forgiveness, let me encourage you today, step out in faith and just trust him and ask him for that forgiveness. Because trust me, you don't want to go to that other place. But the only way you can go to heaven with him, and there's only one way that you can get there, and that's through trusting Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one way, the truth, and the life that leads there. You know, I think about Barabbas, and I think the third thing that I notice is his selection. He was chosen to come and to find that pardon. That life that was there. You see, Barabbas was truly the first person who lived because Jesus died. Because Jesus died in his place and he was set free. I look at Barabbas and I think, what could he have done? You know, could have reacted with indifference. And just thought, man, was I lucky in this case. I got set free and I didn't have to suffer for all the things that I've done. Could have reacted with indifference and, and just sloughed it off and, and not thought about it. Barabbas might have focused on his release and thought, well, I get a second chance. And he could have said, maybe he even went to the cross and watched Jesus die in his place. He might have reacted and said, and found Jesus as his Savior. Truth is, we don't know how Barabbas reacted to this. We just know that he was set free and that he had a chance to choose for himself. 
Today, you have a choice to make. Because just like Barabbas, you are offered your freedom. But you can react to it with indifference and say, Oh, that's for somebody else, it's not for me. And just ignore it and not pay attention to it. Or this morning, you can allow God to speak to your heart, convict you about your sin, and trust Jesus to be your Savior. You can go out of here and live life as normal and go on and ignore it. Or you can choose to make a choice about it and trust Him. But you see, that's up to you to make that choice. If you've already made that choice and you know Jesus as your Savior, then what difference has the cross made in your life? Have you found that life eternal, that life, that excitement in life, that joy in life that comes from following after Jesus? You see, if you're here and you know Jesus as your Savior and yet you look at your life and you haven't changed very much, well then it's time to start following Him and to start changing. You can't continue the same way because you see, the cross makes a difference in everything that we do. For Barabbas, it made a difference between death and life. For you, it makes a difference between death and life. For you, it makes a difference between drudgery and going through life or walking through life with excitement by following Jesus because not knowing what he has in store for you in front of you. But the cross should make a difference for you today. Have you allowed Jesus to change your life? Have you found the excitement, the joy that comes from following Jesus? What's your decision going to be? We're going to pray and then we're going to have a hymn of invitation, a time where we give you a chance to react, to respond to what God has said to your heart. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, come and trust Jesus. Come and find him and ask him for forgiveness. If you know Jesus as your Savior, perhaps you need to start following him. One way that may be by coming and joining this church. You know, just because you attend here doesn't make you a member. You have to ask. And we want you to know that you can come and ask. And you will be welcomed. But you still have to ask. That may be the first step you need to take in following after Jesus. But that's just the first one. It changes the way you live your life at work. It changes the way you live your life in your home. Allow Jesus to make that difference in you. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you again for being here with us. Thank you for the difference the cross makes. God, thank you for how it changes our hearts and how we can find forgiveness and cleansing by coming to you. Find peace in our lives and in our heart. That we can be totally and truly set free from our sin because you take it upon yourself and you become our substitute for us. God, if there's someone here who needs to make a decision for you today to trust you as Savior, to follow you as Lord, Lord, I pray that, that you would speak to their heart and that they would respond to you today. In your name we pray. Amen. We invite you to stand as we sing. If you need to make a decision for Jesus, you come today. Come quickly.